everybody. Um, I just wanted to uh, say I miss you guys and uh, hopefully the first attempt at video lesson goes well. Any and all feedback is appreciated and welcome. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is go through topic two. So you're going to want to have your review books open to topic two. And some of it's review and some of it's kind of newish stuff. Um, so feel free to pause and fast forward as needed. I'm going to have you do some questions during the video. So you're going to need your review book. You may want your answer sheets. Uh, you're going to want a reference table, which you can find Appendix 1A1 in the review book. And for a couple questions, you're going to want a calculator. All right, so topic two. Happy Wednesday, April 1st. Wednesday is going to be our designated science day, but realistically you can access this video whenever. Um, so first of all, what should be complete by today? You should be done with topic one. Um, you should have done most, if not all, of the questions and checked your answers for topic one. And you should have completed the topic one quiz. Yay, I have 41 students and only three of you did not complete it. Um, so everybody is getting credit uh, for attendance this week, and if you are one of those three people, see me and I will open that back up for you. Today we're going to go through topic two, and then at the end of the video I'm going to clarify some due dates and expectations. We're going to end up skipping topic three, um, and then I'm going to introduce this new thing that I have to do, which are called choice activities, and then we'll talk about the quiz. So what has been going on? Um, well, I've been playing a lot of Yahtzee. I got a Yahtzee. I uh, got to see my baby, healthy. And my lovely assistant has been helping me create some of these lessons for you. Um, and so feel free to share what's been going on with you. All right, so topic two. Um, I broke up into five different sections. So we're going to go through each section. I'm going to give you a couple to practice. You did not have to complete any of the questions prior to watching this video, but you should have completed some of the fill in notes and just kind of skimmed through the sections. The first section on chemical symbols and formulas starts on page 26 of your review book. Uh, so the first thing I want to mention is you'll see this IUPAC, I-U-P-A-C, um, a lot when it comes to naming. It stands for the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, and it just means what is the scientific symbol or name for an element or a compound. The next little section on monatomic versus diatomic elements. Monatomic, mono means one, di means two. So most of the elements on the periodic table are monatomic, like copper is just written as Cu, uh, magnesium is just written as Mg, but some are diatomic, and those uh, we affectionately call the Honkelbrifs. So hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and fluorine are always written as H2, O2, N2, etc. They are diatomic elements. There are three different types of formulas. There's molecular formulas, empirical formulas, and structural formulas. So for example, glucose, C6H12O6, that is a molecular formula. It tells you the actual number of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens in the formula. But glucose also has an empirical formula, which is the reduced ratio of all of these um, elements. So I can reduce uh, all of these to C1H2O1, and that would be its empirical formula. So glucose is something that has a molecular and an empirical formula, but something like water, H2O, that can't be reduced any further. So its molecular and empirical formula are the same. Structural formula is the actual drawing. So for example, H2O, if I were to draw its structure, that would be its structural formula. Throughout the rest of this um, section, they give uh, some uh, definitions and some examples. Um, so we haven't talked about hydrates in a while, but hydrates are molecules that have attached water. And when finding the molar mass of a hydrate, you have to add the mass of the attached water. You don't multiply it. 
So for example, copper sulfate, a hydrate of copper sulfate, you would have to add up the copper, the sulfur, the four oxygens, and you would add the mass of two water molecules. When it comes to ion charges, the ion charges or the oxidation states show the number of electrons gained or lost to fill its valence shells. So for example, magnesium has an oxidation state of plus two, which means that it has lost two electrons. Whereas chlorine atoms have oxidation states of minus one, which means that they have gained one electron to fill their valence shell. Polyatomic ions are ions that are covalently bonded, non-metals with a charge, and those can all be found on table E. So for example, hydroxide, OH travels as one unit, and OH has a, an oxidation state of minus one. The coefficients in a balanced equation represent the mole ratios, and we'll talk more about that later. So in this section, numbers 13, 14, and 15a, I wanted to go through this together. So basically just how to read uh, the formula. So for each of the following, number 13 um, has you write the name of the formula, um, each element, and the number of atoms of each. So in letter A, I underlined the two because that's technically number 14. They add the coefficient. In just this piece, I see three potassiums, one phosphorus, and four oxygen atoms. This is potassium phosphate. When I add the coefficient in front, as number 14 does, I multiply everything by two. So there are six potassiums, there are two phosphorus, and there are eight oxygen atoms in two potassium phosphates. And lastly, number 15 wants to know the name of the polyatomic ion. And according to table E, PO4 is the polyatomic ion phosphate. In letter B, number 13, there is one aluminum atom, and then there are three of everything inside the parentheses. So there are three oxygen atoms and there are three hydrogen atoms. In number 14, when you add the coefficient of three in front, there's three of everything after the coefficient. So there are three aluminum atoms, but there are nine oxygen atoms, and there are nine hydrogen atoms. OH, according to table E, is the polyatomic ion hydroxide. Now I'm gonna have you pause the video, and I'm going to have you try a couple from page 30 on your own. So pause the video and try numbers one, four, seven, and 10. Now I want you to pause the video again and check your answers to numbers one, four, seven, and 10. Moving on to the next section on naming compounds, this starts on page 31 of your review book. The most important thing you want to do when naming and writing compounds is their ionic charges have to equal each other. So for example, if you were going to have a formula between magnesium and chlorine, magnesium has a charge of plus two and chlorine has a charge of minus one. So writing just MgCl would not be sufficient because of the plus two minus one charge. So you would need two chlorine atoms to balance out one magnesium. There are different kinds of ionic compounds and covalent compounds. Binary ionic compounds are those that just have one cation and one anion, like NaCl or CaO. Ionic compounds with polyatomic ions, those are those from table E, also need to balance out their charges. Binary covalent compounds is something we really don't see in regions chemistry very much, but you can refer to table 2-4 for prefixes. For example, one is mono, two is di, and uh, so on. The stock system is where a lot of us kind of had a lot of problems during the school year, and that's when you have to know when and when not to use Roman numerals. So when the metal or the positive ion has more than one oxidation state option on your reference table, you need to indicate that. So I wanna go through number 33 together. 
So find number 33 in this section um, of the review book on page 33. Vanadium V has more than one oxidation state. So it asks you to write the correct formulas for vanadium three, which means vanadium with a plus three oxide, and vanadium five, meaning vanadium with a plus five oxidation state, and how it bonds with oxygen to form vanadium oxide. Oxygen always has an oxidation state of minus two. So I like to use that crisscross method here to figure out what the formula would be. Crisscross method meaning crisscross the charges and make them subscripts. So vanadium three oxide would be written as V2O3. Whereas vanadium five oxide would be written as V2O5. So the Roman numerals three literally means that its oxidation state is plus three, whereas five means that its oxidation state is plus five. Oxygens does not change. Pause the video again, and I want you to try a couple different naming compound problems on pages 32 to 33. You will need your periodic table for this. So again, if you don't have one, Appendix A1 in this review book has a reference table. So pause the video and give these a try. When you're done, pause the video again and check your answers. I don't think we need to spend a ton of time on the next section on chemical reactions and equations, um, but basically starting on page 33, some clues that something is a chemical change versus a physical change. Chemical changes involve forming new uh, products with different chemical formulas than what went in. Things like fizzing and bubbling and burning are all big clues that something is chemical. Whereas physical changes tend to be phase changes like melting, freezing, sublimation, deposition, vaporization, etc. Or creating a solution, an aqueous solution. So salt dissolving in water is also a physical change. Reactants are the things that go in or are on the left side of an equation whereas products are the things that are made and they are on the right side of the equation. What is new uh, from this uh, part of the topic is this idea of energy in the form of heat. And so energy in the form of heat is lost or gained in all chemical reactions. Way back when we talked about the definition of temperature and that is different than heat energy and it's also different than potential energy. Average kinetic energy is just the motion of the particles and that is its given temperature. Potential energy is a new term for us in the chemistry world and it represents the energy that's stored in chemical bonds. We are going to talk a lot more about potential energy in topic eight. So endothermic and exothermic are two new terms for us. Endothermic reactions involve energy coming into an equation. So where you would find energy in an endothermic reaction is on the left side or the reactant side of an equation. In an endothermic reaction, energy is absorbed. So the surrounding temperature is going to decrease. Delta H is a value that we're going to actually calculate later in topic eight but the delta H just represents the difference in potential energy from beginning to end. So it's positive because we are absorbing energy. And an example of an endothermic reaction from the review book is the melting of water. There is more energy in the products than there is in the reactants. And that's going to come back again in topic eight, where we take our potential energy of our products minus the reactants to get a delta H value. That is where that positive value comes from. But again, we don't need to calculate that yet. In an exothermic reaction, you're going to find energy on the right side because it is exiting or leaving the equation as a product. The surrounding temperature is going to increase or feel hotter because you are releasing energy to your environment. 
the delta H value here is going to be pot, uh, negative because we are losing energy to the environment. An example here is combustion from your uh, topic two review book. And you're gonna have less energy in the products than you did in the reactants. Again, because you are losing heat energy to your environment. They actually don't ask a ton more questions about this in the review book, um, but um, we will again tackle this more in topic eight. Also in this section, we uh, go through balancing chemical equations on pages 35 to 36. So I thought that we would just do one together to refresh your memory, um, but this was something that we've already been tested on. So number 38 on page 35 asks to, um, when the equation is correctly balanced, what is the sum of the coefficients? So remember when you're balancing a chemical equation, you split up the reactants and the products and you make an inventory of everything that's in your equation. Since SO4 or sulfate stays together beginning to end, I'm gonna keep it together from the beginning to the end. So as I go through this problem, I invite you to do the same on a separate sheet of paper. I have two aluminums, three sulfates, and I got those from the subscripts. I have only one zinc and two chlorines on the left side of my equation. On the right, I have one aluminum. I only have one SO4 or sulfate. I only have one zinc and I have three chlorines. So one thing I might wanna try first is maybe I want to try to balance my aluminums. So what that would do is I have two on the left and only one on the right. So if I try a coefficient of two, that would change my aluminums to two and it would also change my chlorines to six. So how could I fix that on the left? Well, let's try a three in front of the zinc chloride to try to balance out my chlorines. That's gonna change my zincs to three and it's gonna change my chlorines to six. So what I could do here then is to fix my sulfate and my zinc problem. If I add a coefficient of three on the right, that's going to fix the zinc and the sulfate problem. I have to balance the equation first in order to answer the, uh, the question that they're actually asking. When balanced correctly, the sum of the coefficients is, well, remember we have an imaginary one here, plus three, plus two, plus three. If I add those all together, I get nine, which is choice one. I'm gonna have you try two of the balancing equations on page 36, number 40 and 42, so pause the video and try those out. Pause the video again and check your answers. All right, another piece of review. Um, before we left, we were getting ready to have a test on types of reactions. Um, so on pages 37 and 40, we're just gonna quickly recap the four different types of chemical reactions. Synthesis and decomposition, we were really good at recognizing those. In synthesis, you're taking two reactants and making one product. In decomposition, you're taking one reactant and you're breaking it up into multiple products. For single replacement, you had one ion replacing another, and you're going to need table J to do an example on the following uh, slide. With double replacement, those reactions will only occur if one of the products forms a precipitate or a solid. We'll do an example using table F. If one of the products is a gas, or if water is formed, that is when a double replacement will occur. So let's talk about single replacement reactions. How do you know if a single reaction will spontaneously occur? Well, table J is the activity series and it tells you which metals are more active than others. It also tells you which nonmetals are more active than others, but typically we're going to be using metals. So in the equation, zinc plus copper nitrate produces copper plus zinc nitrate, that reaction will occur. If you look at where zinc and copper are placed on the activity series, 
zinc will want to replace copper in a compound and kick copper out by itself. Since the zinc and the copper switched places from beginning to end, that is a single replacement reaction. The second reaction below, copper will not replace zinc because it is less active, so no reaction will occur. So the bottom line is here, metals that are more active than others will want to be the one in the compound and the less active metal will be kicked out by itself. In double replacement reactions, you have to know whether or not a precipitate will uh, be formed. So if a precipitate is not formed or a gas is not formed or water is not formed, then a double replacement reaction will not occur. I know that the reaction at the bottom of your screen here will occur because one of these products is going to form a solid or a precipitate. So let's look at AgCl. Cl is a halide. I don't see silver anywhere on this list or this list. So I know that anything that has Cl minus ions in it is going to be aqueous, except when it combines with Ag. And in this case, this is an exception, which means that this is an insoluble compound. NaNO3, Na is a group one ion, nitrate, is also on our list as a soluble or aqueous compound, and there are no exceptions to that rule. So this will be an aqueous. So I know that a double replacement will occur between these two reactants because one of them forms a precipitate. Pause the video and try number 59, identifying what type of reaction all of those are. Pause the video and check your answers. Last but not least, um, unknown reactants and products. We're gonna focus just on conservation of mass because that's what the Regents focuses on. Mass cannot be created nor destroyed. So the mass that goes in on your reactant side of the equation is the mass that has to be produced. So let's try number 78 together. You're going to need your calculator for this. So I want to know how many pounds of sulfur will be produced from the decomposition of 318.2 pounds of copper one sulfide to produce 254 pounds of copper metal and sulfur according to the equation. So I know that I have 318.2 pounds of reactant. I know that I make 254 pounds of copper and I want to know what is the mass of the missing sulfur. The coefficient of two in front of the copper does not mean that I have two times that amount of copper. The balanced equation already represents what I have made. So all I need to do is take my 318.2 and subtract the 254 pounds of copper, which leaves me with a mass of 64.2. So the missing mass of sulfur, my pen's not working right now, but the missing mass of sulfur would be 64.2 pounds. All right, so that brings us to the end of our information in topic two. So what do you do now? Good question. Something new that I have to offer you each week is what's called a choice activity. And I think that this is actually going to uh, minimize some of the work that you have to do. So you are going to choose one of the three options below. In the review book at the end of each topic, as you know from topic one, there's a bunch of Regents practice questions. So one of your options will be to independently complete just the following numbers on pages 43 and 44 of your review book. So independently, you can just uh, choose to do part A, numbers 1 through 10, part B, just the odd numbers, 11 through 21, and then only three um, in part C, you can do 26, 34, and 35. So one option is to do all of those on your own and check the answers with the answer key all independently. 
Option two is to do those same questions, but to do them live with me in a Zoom conference. I'm gonna send you a survey to see which day works best um, for the majority. And if nobody wants to do a live Zoom conference, then you can just do them independently. Um, so watch for a survey coming to you this week and I will choose a day and time where we can go through those uh, questions together. Option three, if you don't wanna do any of these practice questions, I thought since this is a unit on chemical reactions, you could choose to recreate your Alka-Seltzer rocket and record your launch. So all you would need for that is the soda bottle, any materials uh, uh, that you would need. You can look back at your lab notebook to see how you did it the first time. Um, you'll need Alka-Seltzer tablets. You can send me a remind and I can drop some off to you. Um, but if you don't want to do any questions and you would rather just rebuild your rocket, you can record and email me a video of your launch. <laughs> Due dates. Your choice activity should be done sometime between now and when you take the quiz. The topic two quiz is open until this Sunday at midnight. Moving forward, I have decided to skip topic three completely and break topic four up into the next two weeks. So after Sunday, I'm gonna take you now to Schoology. Topic one is already done. And topic two is what we're doing now. So you have already done what you need to do. You've logged on today, April 1st, to watch the video lesson. You're gonna complete one of those three choice activities before you take the quiz and you're going to complete the top of two quiz by this Sunday, April 5th at midnight. We're gonna to skip topic three. So what's coming up next, all of those due dates are here in the topic four folder. So after Sunday, the next thing you'll have to do is to just log on April 8th for the next video lesson on just the first half of topic four. Complete any notes or definitions prior to logging into that video. I'm gonna then give you another choice activity and another quiz for that Sunday, and then we'll move on to the second half of topic four. So again, we're gonna to skip topic three, jump into topic four. This week, I just need you to wrap up topic two by completing your choice activity and taking your quiz by Sunday. Alrighty. Well, thanks for joining me for our very first video lesson. Um, watch for a survey if you're interested in doing the live uh, Zoom conference to do a choice activity. Um, if not, um, just continue to reach out as needed. Uh, miss you all and I hope you're doing well.